depending on where you are. I'm extremely excited to introduce a researcher from Florida Atlantic University within the Gumbo Limbo Lab today, Dr. Jeanette Weineken. I had the honor to volunteer in both the lab and field work. Dr. Weineken works with sea turtles, and today she'll be presenting her studies on sex ratios and the relationship between the changing weather and climate and hatchlings. Um, so just two things, please remember to stay muted throughout the presentation. And since we're going to have a high volume of participants, uh, please write your question in the chat and then at the end, um, Dr. Weineken will address them. So the theoretical floor is yours, Dr. Weineken. All right, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk. This is, uh, I get to talk about some of my favorite topics. Uh, our title, uh, Temperature, Torrents, and Turtles, deals with basically weather effects on, on our uh, sea turtle nests, uh, the torrents are hurricanes and tropical storms. And uh, I'm sorry to uh, talk. Um, is it okay that we record this? Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So the yeah the and the turtles are um, you know, are I'm probably going to be speaking about loggerhead turtles, which are the turtles here on the left. These are hatchlings. Uh, that's the genus uh, Coretta species Coretta, so Coretta Coretta. Uh, we also have two other species on our, our beaches, uh, the uh, green turtle, uh, Colonia mitis, and the leatherback, Dermachilles coriacea. They're using the beaches for, uh, to deposit their nests, and otherwise they're in our waters, either as migrating through or um, uh, for feeding grounds. So uh, I'm on the southeast coast of the Florida Peninsula, and uh, so that's a turtle hotspot. So I'm gonna to start today with uh, some natural history and then get into uh, some of our laboratory where uh, uh, Monica was uh, a volunteer. She, uh, she had uh, wanted some aquaculture experience and basically what we're doing is raising turtles to get uh, sex ratio data. Uh, we need them big enough so we can do that. Uh, but and then we get our turtles offshore and, and release them after after we're getting done getting our sex ratio work. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the new work we've gotten into uh, on looking at the effects of uh, incubation temperatures and uh, hurricanes. So that'll that that'll be a kind of a, our main focus today. So. Let's get started. So for those of you who are not familiar with, with the natural history of sea turtles, we, we basically have hatchlings that um, emerge on their own. There's no parent present. Um, on the nesting beach, they migrate out to the open water where they live in the pelagic uh, flotsam areas. Uh, then reach after they reach somewhere along the lines of uh, about uh, 20 to 45 centimeters, they um, migrate back to the coastal areas where they become benthic feeders and uh, stay that in migrating along the coast uh, to feeding grounds. And then when they mature, uh, they'll, they'll mate and then okay. start, start this process. Is that a question? <laughs> Guess not. Okay, uh, so those are our hatchlings. Uh, those are our pelagic juveniles. Then we have our large juveniles, which are benthic, and then our uh, adults. All right, so just a bit of uh, nesting biology. This is a loggerhead turtle, there's the head. This is the shell covered with sand. So they're these big, uh, big turtles, they're about, uh, the, the shell is about a meter long. Uh, they'll come ashore, they d dig a kind of an area in the sand called a body pit. And then with their hind flippers, which I'll show you in a minute, they uh, dig a nest. But when they dig the nest, they're, they're actually throwing sand forward to get it out of the way. And the, so their shells become covered with sand while they're nesting. Uh, this is a loggerhead turtle uh, from the back view, um, depositing eggs in the nest that she's dug. Uh, and you can see that sand on the shell there. Um, this is a, an extension of the cloaca um, that uh, uh, extrudes when they're uh, laying eggs. 
And then most of these nestings are not observed because it's at, most of them are at night. So we find our nests usually the next morning uh, by looking at these tracks that you know the turtle came up, the, tur and the turtle left, and then the nest is somewhere off the lower part of the screen. These I'm in an urban uh, area, so that means that there are other people on the beach during the day, and um, so we mark off the nests with uh, stakes and tape just to keep people from uh, putting their picnic baskets and their beach umbrellas on and digging it. We don't want them digging into the nests. This is a nest that actually uh, pred predators dug into. We are, our predators are um, raccoons, procyon, uh, loacher, and uh, occasionally uh, skunks. And I don't remember the genus of our skunks right now. All right, so the eggs are uh, incubated uh, with, uh, in the sand without a, the parent present, so they're not like birds. And about a month and a half to uh, two months later, we get a, the eggs hatching. The turtles sit down in the sand for uh, a day to several days. And then they usually emerge from the, the nest at uh, during the nighttime or after the sand cools. Usually sand cooling is when there's a heavy rain. And uh, so we, uh, this is what an, uh, an emergence after a rain um, looks like these are little loggerheads um, emerging on their own, and uh, they uh, are making their way to the to the beach or to, to the ocean rather. And they will swim for about 36 hours without stopping, which is pretty impressive for these little turtles. And um, then uh, yeah, get out into the the uh, Gulf Stream current, which is their for in the, in the Atlantic, that's their main dispersal current. All right, so these are uh, it, imperiled species. So much of the work we do is associated with managing imperiled species. And the main question, research question I've been focusing on uh, is what hatchling sex ratios are produced. And uh, we're trying to get that information uh, because the, these are um, animals for which the sex is in determined environmental by envi environmental factors during incubation, primarily temperature and moisture effects. Um, this is a hatchling loggerhead. This is an adult, so we work with the young turtles. It's not easy to work with the adults. These uh, adults take um, somewhere along the lines of 25 to 35 years to mature. So they, they're long-lived animals, but maturing late. Um, you know, we know that the populations are imperiled. They're either not increasing. Uh, you know, there's been a, a number of uh, studies that showed that they are bycatch in fisheries, and that, that's been removing juveniles from the populations. And their beaches, for nesting beaches, have been compromised over time because they live in nice places and so do people want to live there. So uh, there's a number of factors that's leading to them being imperiled. But the bigger, bigger issue is because they have environmentally determined, determined sex, we need to know what normal sex ratios were. And that's how I got into this work. I started in 2002. I thought I'd be doing this work on sex ratios for a couple of years, never realizing how much variation we'd be facing. And I'd also was not expecting to be documenting increase in nest temperatures. Um, so it became important to ask the question, do we have enough males and do we have enough females or do we have a highly skewed sex ratios? And we need to know that now, not 25, 30, 35 years from now. Um, so when we look at, uh, Turtles, this is not a loggerhead, this is an Ollett Ridley. Uh, what you find is if you measure the, the temperatures in the sand, um, you know, this is a, a model, but it's, it's basically showing you the kind of the, the configuration of the sand and the eggs. Uh, you know, it's, it's cooler lower down, and typically the our nests are about the same temperature uh, with, within the eggs. Uh, but as you get Farther, you know, closer to the surface, it's warmer, 
unless of course we get um, heavy, heavy rains. And uh, the things of course that can affect the nest temperature are uh, our storms and uh, you know, how much cloud cover we have, how much sun we have, and if the nest is laid in the shade. So most of our loggerhead nests are in the middle of the beach, but some go up near the, the dune. Um, like I said, this is an urban area, so our dunes also have um, buildings called the cast shadows. And so these nests would get uh, shade earlier in the day and may not get quite as warm. Uh, all right, so when we talk about the impact of the environment, we're, there's, there's a number of things that are affecting the, the nest environment, and that's uh, that it determines hatch, hatching, hatchling development rates and success. So the warmer the nest up to a point, the faster it is, and the warmer the nest up to a point, its success uh, is um, determined between about 24 degrees is the lowest that a nest will develop and about um, 35 after after about 33 we start seeing declines in uh, in nest success and then about after about 35 we see serious declines in nest success so uh, the temperature is uh, the main determinant of the sex of the hatchlings and also the temperature of, uh, is in that range is important because it supports the metabolic activity of the developing embryos and it, it allows for exchanges. The sand um, temperature does affect uh, the exchange of respiratory gases. So if any one of these things is poor, it's gonna be a compromise to development. I'm gonna primarily focus on the, the parts that determine sex and how we go about measuring that. And um, I'll conclude a little bit with these um, components on uh, development and nest success. So with those of you who are not familiar with temperature dependent sex determination, uh, the basic pattern is that warmer temperatures produce females and cooler temperatures produce males. We knew we did not have a one-to-one -one sex ratio based on some previous work that had been done. Um, our sex ratio is more female skewed. And uh, we knew we were expecting that uh, it's it's you know, the the nesting beaches are uh, used during the summer months. It's hot during the summer months, so you would expect a female bias in the population. That's true most places in in the world. So what was that? And as you, I saw, showed you the size difference between a hatchling and an adult. So to ask this question, what sex ratio is uh, produced? Uh, we uh, you know we're, each year. We needed a way to measure neonate sex ratios, not wait that 25 or 30 years for maturity. And we were faced with this problem of, well, how do you tell the, the, the males from the females? And I was really hoping for something like this, but no, not going to happen. We had that we were faced with something like this. And uh, the previous work that had been done was, um, you know, these hatchling. Um, measures were sacrificing hatchlings and some populations can uh, can tolerate that but when you're dealing with severely imperiled species you really want to want to avoid killing off your production um, so that was we were, we made the decision that we were going to come up with another way of identifying the sex uh, other groups have used an indirect temperature based model um, with, but the problem is there's been very limited verification and that was because the, the verification at the times we were starting was based on um, sacrificing the hatchlings and looking at their, their gonads. So my approach was I had um, through, much, through a, another aspect of my uh, training in my career, I was teaching um, anatomy reptile anatomy to veterinarians and when I would attend their meetings I would find um, you know meet, meet with some of the vendors and we uh, we quickly realized that if they were uh, sexing little tiny birds with uh, laparoscopy I could develop a way to do that in turtles and that's that's what I did so I'll tell you a little bit about that process 
Um, we also measured um, the temperature in every nest that we look at. And then we verify the sex of ha a sample of hatchlings. And not everyone does this. It's, it turns out our data set is, is rather unique in having um, a sample from across the season. We, this is my former graduate student now, Dr. Alex Lolovar. She's using our, our temperature logger. Uh, to, and she did both a field uh, study and we work with natural nests in the, as well to understand the temperature relationships. And so um, we, uh, we use field and lab studies and there's a whole suite of things. Finding the eggs in a turtle nest the next morning is not always easy. The turtles are good at, dis at disguising that next nest. We, they, they're not like bird eggs, so you don't turn them. You have to keep them oriented in the same position when you're moving them. And, and uh, because turning the eggs uh, can uh, rupture some of the form early egg membranes and, and kill the embryo. So then we take our, if we have to move the eggs for our uh, field studies, we are planting the eggs in a hole. So we have to, and then, you know, you have to water them if, if there's no rain. And then we wait for the hatchlings emergence. So that's, that's the experimental side. Uh, with the field side, we have to find the nest um, and then remove a few eggs, put our, our data logger in, and it records the temperature every 15 minutes uh, throughout the entire incubation. So we get this instrument back after the nest hatches. And then we have a lot of data we have to look at. Um, and that's, that's been really good because even if we don't have a Measure, uh, weather station nearby to tell us when it's raining. It, with the 15 minute intervals, we can pick up when rain, uh, rain percolates down into the nest. So we are on an area with predators. We, so we started um, putting these cages on. Um, and so we, it, we, we check them um, at night and then by midnight we stop. And the next morning uh, we'll come out and often find little loggerheads waiting to be collected. Uh, this way we're collecting the first group of turtles to come out of the nest. So sometimes they'll all come out at once, but more often they'll come out in over one or two or three nights. So we're making a, a decision that the first turtles to get out are probably the strong, healthy ones, the ones liable to contribute to the next generation. And so that's why we use, that's one of the reasons we use the cages. They also help prevent the raccoons and the uh, skunks to, from getting in. So we bring the, the turtles to the lab. We sample 10 turtles per, per nest. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we raise them in the lab. So this is a one month old, these are hatchlings. This is a one month old turtle. And this is uh, a turtle that's, the size that we worked on while we were um, to, to get this, the sex of the turtle. So anywhere from three to six months, depending on the water temperature. And uh, they, they're about 120 grams when, when we are able to sex them. So, and they start to get these spines. These are uh, sh pretty sharp, surprisingly. They don't look that sharp, but they are. Uh, so in order to figure out how to safely maintain these animals in captivity and track them, we had to uh, come up with uh, kind of a, what I describe as a short-term turtle aquaculture system. And so part of what we were doing was having to, their natural habitat is, is in sargassum, at least in the Atlantic. They, they stay in these spaces in the sargassum. And if you take them out of that, they swim back into it. So we uh, needed to give them some space with some pr protective uh, sides to it and flow through. Um, and that, so these little baskets, plastic baskets, ended up being our, um, our surrogate sargassum. And that's what we, we uh, use. We start the tur training the, the hatchlings to eat shrimp when they're about three to five days. And then as soon as they are eating on their own, uh, we make our own turtle diet. Uh, Monica can tell you all about learning how to make turtle diets. We have a different diet for each species and um, it's, it's worked out quite well. We cut it up in cubes and, and put it in from the top and then the turtles learn to feed um, on either floating or 
uh, sinking food and it, it works out pretty, it's worked out really well actually. Um, you know, because we're dealing with a large number of turtles, our, we have a flow through seawater system. This, um, this system of baskets, this is the next size basket up. You can see all the holes on the side are perfect for flow through. Um, it allows us to control um, our identification system. You'll see these turtles all have dots on them. Those are uh, children's fingernail polish that we use to mark the, the individuals. And then, uh, you know, the baskets prevent the uh, social hierarchies from forming. So that's why we don't keep them together. These are not a schooling species. Um, this also allows us to control the food intake. We, we are trying to use uh, a, a standard of 11 to 13% uh, of body weight a day using with our uh, diets. And the baskets, again, provide kind of a, that, that surrogate flotsam niche where they're, they've got a, you know, material around them that water flows through. And then uh, our ID system is also written on the, the basket. So we, we are able to track individuals from the time they come out of the nest till the time they leave using uh, this, uh, this, this system. Uh, this is our laboratory. All of these tanks have flow through seawater. Um, we are able to move um, uh, the turtles into the, this back area if we need to. We also raise leatherback sea turtles in the, in the sea uh, when, in some years. So um, we can convert these tanks over for leatherbacks. Leatherbacks are not raised in baskets because they do not use flotsam and uh, as they're, they're an open ocean blue water species. So we actually have to put leatherbacks um, on little leashes and uh, only one turtle per these round tanks and two or three for the square tanks or re rectangular tanks. So it's a, it's a convertible system. I also have colleagues who work on sharks and rays and if they have small ones, they can also use these tanks when we don't have turtles in them. So uh, we, the reason why they're indoors is because we're in an urban area without nighttime security and we have predators that live in the park where the FAU Marine Lab is located. So um, as I mentioned, we develop, uh, we raise the turtles up and I developed this laparoscopic sex identification system. This was used, this kind of system is used in big turtles. What I've seen specialized in is working with the small ones. Um, so we use a, a lidocaine, which is a, a local anesthesia in the uh, inguinal part of the leg. So I'm holding the turtle upside down here and uh, looking inside. And so the ovary is, is located on top of the kidney as is the, the testis, but it is, the ovary is, is more uh, kind of viscous looking and um, it folds over itself. This is the, um, the testis, it's more compact and uh, it, you know, it has more of a like big granular surface um, that it's the seminiferous tubules. And then again, this is on top of the, the, uh, the kidney. So we use the kidney as one of our landmarks and the end of the lung, which is right next to the kidney is another landmark. And this has worked out. We're now, we've been 100% accurate in this technique uh, since uh, 2004. All right, so what are we finding? Uh, this is a graph showing years. Now, I, while I've do it, been doing this longer than 2006, we started using a very consistent system. And what you've got here is the percentage female of our, our nests. And these, these numbers here are the number of nests for which we had um, reliable temperature data. Um, like I say, in 2006, we we had a number of temperature loggers fail. That was when I first switched over to a different, the ones we use now. Um, and uh, so, but we still had our 120 turtles, 10 from each of 12 nests. And so the, these, are, these are pretty robust um, numbers of turtles contributing these sex ratios for the whole beach. And again, this is the loggerhead turtle, uh, which uh, this was taken right off the, the uh, beach in, uh, in about 40 feet of water. Uh, but anyway, this is, this is what we're finding. 
percentage female is very high. Our 50% mark is would have been right in the middle. And what you can quickly see you know, is that in most years, we have a very strong female bias. Now the white bars are those years in which the National Weather Service has designated our weather as, and our nest temperatures and our rainy season as normal. So it, over the last 14 years, we have only had three years that were considered normal. Um, we've had many years, the red bars are the ones that where the National Weather Service said it was hotter than normal. Um, and each year from 2015 on, we've had each year was, was a record high temperature. So 2015 was a record high until 2016 happened. That was a record high um, temperature year. Then 2017 was a record high temperature year and, and so on. And we're getting more and more t years that are record high temperatures. Um, so that that was um, that was pretty pretty Im, Im, important to discover that we're you know our, the air temperatures are not only the only thing they're getting hot the turtle nests are getting hot too the blue bars are years when we've had a higher than normal rainfall or and and that's also affecting um, the percentage of females so you can see. 2009, it was a very wet year, but it was wet very early in the season and wet very late in the season. The middle of the season was also quite hot. So um, even though it came in as a, a wet, wetter than normal year, the nest temperatures were much warmer than normal. Um, 12, 12, 2012, 20, 2013 were wetter than normal and um, we were getting good, um, good hatch success, not quite as skewed a, temp, uh, a, a temperature. And, um, but then, then everything has gotten a lot warmer. So in 2019, we, we did have some males produced and in 2020, we had some males produced, but it's still between 90 and 95% um, are uh, female. So it's still a highly skewed population. Uh, this year, these years that are lower uh, in terms of production of females are years that even if they're hot, when we have hurricanes, they eliminate um, a lot of the, the nests that would, would have produced females. And so that's what reduces our, our um, production of females is it depends on when the hurricanes come, which, which nests they're taking out. Because we're sampling throughout the entire season. So early season, Early in the season, which would be April, May, uh, nests, those are incubating cool and then getting warmer. Um, middle season nests, May, late May, June, July, are middle season nests, and then end of July, August, September are late season nests. So for the loggerhead, those are those middle season nests are tend to be pretty hot and the end of the season nests tend to be hot and hotter unless we get a hurricane. And then th that cools things down and it also eliminates a lot of nests because they wash out. So these hatchling sex ratios are highly biased and um, the hot or the hot dry conditions can skew the sex ratios even more. And 2015, 16 and 17 were very hot dry years. All right, so the, uh, just to give you some perspective on where these turtles nest, I'm gonna contrast these with uh, another species we, we have on the beach. So uh, up in the top, this, this is vegetation here at the high part of the beach at the dune, so up in this area, and that's where the green turtles go to nest. So when the green turtles, Chelonia or Colonia mitis come up, they'll come all the way up and tend to nest in the higher, uh, shadier part of the beach, whereas the loggerheads tend to nest in the middle to low beach. So their nests are in the uh, hot and unshaded areas. And so this is a loggerhead nest. This, these are loggerhead nests. All of these little things that we've staked off here are loggerhead nests. So the loggerheads have, are uh, nesting in, in areas that are more prone to um, 
the uh, the hot dry conditions, and as a result, we're we're seeing that in in the sex ratios we've been uh, measuring. All right, so we all know that um, the climate change is is a real threat. Um, we're seeing changes now in in, our, in the severity of the storms we're getting. Uh, parts of Florida are seeing increases in sea level uh, rise that are flooding streets. Uh, where I am, that's not the flooding is not a problem yet. I'm in a little higher part of Florida, um, but we we really are focusing a lot on the temperature and precipitation, and particularly the the effect, those effects of total precipitation and its severity. Not just did it rain a lot, was it a, a tropical storm that uh, pushed the waves up over the nests or not? And uh, so uh, this is what a, a beach looks like after a hurricane. It's flattened out. The nests have been underwater. These are, are the debris lines or the rack lines from when the storms come through. And uh, so I'm gonna, what I'm, Showing you here are two graphs for the log for the green turtle and the loggerhead. So Colonia mitis was the one in the in the bushes, and Coretta Coretta is the one in the uh, middle of the beach. And we f started looking at our data from the perspective of how much of uh, the incubation uh, or was above 33 degrees, and how much was, how many years did we have wash over. And so these are um, percent hatching success. So in other words, did the nest even make it to hatching? And that's the uh, um, diamonds here. And then the blue bars are the percent of incubation spent above that thermal maximum. And uh, so what you can see is earlier on, there was, um, less of a, a, lo a lot a number of years for a small percentage of the time was spent below the thermal maximum and when when we have a, a low uh, period of time incubating above this 30 to 3 degrees we tend to have higher hatching success and when we have more of the time spent um, incubating at uh, the higher temperatures we have so somewhat lower success there are some exceptional years. Uh, 2017 was was one of them, uh, where the it started off as a record high, but then in August we started getting regular rains, not a tropical storm, but regular rains, and that helped rescue a lot of these these nests. Um, now again, these are the ones that are up in the shade. If we look at the loggerheads, which are in the middle of the beach, we uh, we see uh, higher success in um, these low, uh, in these periods when we had um, less temperatures that were high. And we also had hurricanes this year. The, 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 this originally surprised me that these hurricanes were not having a bigger impact. But what it, when I went back and looked at the data in detail, what it showed me is in hurricane years, yes, we get fewer nests that are above that temperature, but that's because the nests, the remaining nests that would normally be part of that population were washed out to sea or dead. So the ones that did hatch, uh, that didn't get washed over had a high success. So um, we're starting to appreciate kind of the, the nuances that the hurricanes give us. They basically eliminate the really hot, hot, hot nests that are near the, near the, uh, uh, nearer to the ocean. So, um, so we're really, uh, the, the take home from this is the green turtles are, are probably benefiting from this. The loggerheads, uh, the data look like they're benefiting from it, but the absolute production of hatchlings is not, uh, not benefiting. And uh, so basically our summary is that the hatchling sex ratios are shifting to be more female biased. The high, uh, hot, dry conditions can decrease our egg survival. Um, our emergent hatchlings, those are the ones that make it out uh, from hot nests, tend to all be females. And uh, that rainfall may buffer those high temperature effects and can increase our, our embryo survival. That's uh, 
another nuance. And but the time and the timing and the severity of rain and, and wave wash up matters to the success of these these nests. And uh, with that, we'll uh, I'll take any questions. I I'm not sure how I get to the chat from this, uh, so maybe I have to stop sharing my screen. Um, I guess if you have questions, uh, you can send them on the chat. I can read them to you if that's just easier. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll stop my sharing here. And uh, so we have one question that's, do you have any idea regarding the bias in sex ratios at the level of molecular biology or epigenetics? So uh, very good question. I actually have had a postdoc and a student working on, uh, we, we did look for um, uh, impacts, epigenetic Im impacts, um, and particularly looked at, we're looking for methylation of, uh, of some of the key genes that are turned on in development. And initially we thought we were seeing that, um, but I, we, we now think that that was, um, that, that we were, we were making a correlation between methylation and the, the nest temperatures. We, we now know that when the eggs are, are getting more water, they're able to manage temperature a little better. So you can think of, think of the eggs as being, uh, you know, trapped in space. The embryos are trapped. They can't run away from temperature. So, so if the eggs are getting too hot, the only capacity they ha have for cooling is um, release of, of moisture. And if they have enough moisture uh, in the nest, then, then they can cool. But if there's not enough moisture for the eggs to take it in and, and give it off, because if they're giving off, if the eggs are giving off moisture, that's a, they're also having to basically give off heat. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're controlling that. In, in terms of the um, identifying the sex, uh, we've, we've done, done some work, we've published a paper on that um, last year, uh, last year, I think it was last year, on uh, looking at some of the hormones that are the proteins that are expressed during development. And uh, we, we have a, a method. It's not easy to scale up at this point. And we were looking at an, um, a, a protein called uh, anti-mullerian hormone. And uh, the anti-mullerian hormone is, uh, it basically is responsible for regressing the, uh, the mullerian duct that would be the, the duct that used to be uh, draining the embryonic kidney. It, it gets co-opted to be an oviduct in the females and it uh, becomes uh, it becomes lost or re very reduced in males. So, but that o it only works in hatchlings. Um, you know, any, when the turtles get a little older, that hormone takes on a different role. And so it's, it's uh, the cool part is that it may give us ways to um, work, you know, work out population level sex ratios rather than beach level sex ratios. However, um, we need to, we're, we're still working on scaling that up. I have a graduate student whose PhD thesis is really focused around refining those techniques, those molecular techniques so we can get there. Um, and uh, she's, she's making great progress, but I, I don't want to don't want to get too much into what she's doing because she's a graduate student and that's her PhD work. <laughs> so, um, There's another question. Are the temperatures determining the sex the same for every turtle species? For every, uh, are, is that question about individual turtles or uh, every species? I believe just to the species. At the species level, um, there, it looks, that's a really good question as well. I mean, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, just in our own data, if I plot out uh, the, the temperatures, whether it's, uh, there's an, and there are a number of ways of looking at te the temperature. Um, average is not a good one. Uh, there's a group in France that's looking at 
um, developmental rates as a function of temperature at time at, temp at particular temperatures. Uh, that's Mark Girondeau's group at Paris, and they're doing a great job of um, looking at how we should be measuring temperature, uh, or excuse me, how we should be using temperature. And uh, these, their, their works is, uh, helps explain how, um, how variable uh, responses are. And uh, so even in a, a nest where, uh, while we don't have a, a temperature recording device on each egg, we, we're not, and we're sampling the nest, we're not sampling every turtle, we're taking 10% 10, 10 because we want to characterize the beach. We really don't have the resolution to tell you that each turtle is doing the same thing, but it looks like there's, there's some very slight variation in response. And uh, the slight variation may be um, related to developmental rate, or it may be related to um, you know some other uh, temperature moisture relationship that we haven't haven't detected yet. But um, there are different species that have different temperature sex ratio responses that are so. For example, the olive ridley turtle, that's uh, Lepidocheles olivacea, uh, that species seems to have a higher um, thermal tolerance than, than others. It's a, it's a tropical turtle, tends, tends to, a number of their populations nest on black beaches, so their nests get pretty hot. And, um, and so those turtles look, seem to have a, a temperature, response, temperature sex response that shift a little bit um, higher, but in general, the the statistical midpoint is about 29 and a half degrees. Um, also, uh, someone asked, based on the findings of the paper you discussed, do you know if this method is being applied in other research centers as well? The the um, the 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 is this the with regard to the AMH um, molecular paper or the the, the laparoscopy paper? Uh, if uh, no, the AMA, the AMA. It, it popped up. It just popped ah, okay, up. Okay, great. Yeah, um, I I don't know if others are are using it yet. I know that some people have tried to tried it at a large scale, and we get um, questions about how did you do the, all of these. <laughs> That's like at this point, it's um, a lot of work. Um, we're like I say, we're my other my my current graduate student PhD student is, um, is working on that. And um, I, I don't, don't know um, if anybody else is using it with sea turtles. We, we tested it with, with uh, the loggerhead Coretta Coretta, and we also tested it with um, the red-eared slider turtle, which is um, a you know, common experimental kind of turtle, turtle uh, model species. Uh, you know, I, I don't, at this, at this point, I cannot say that for sure that it works in all species. I know that it, we have t tested it in, you know, different ages of turtles in the lab. And by the time we get them up around 120 um, to or grams or higher, then it's no longer, you know, it's still, there's a tendency for males to still have some AMH present, but females are starting to show it. And it, like I say, it serves different roles. It, in different parts of um, the life. So it's not as predictive and I would not trust it if I needed to really know my sex ratios at an older life stage. We, we have had a number of people contact us about using it with older turtles and I'm, I just tell them, no, don't do it. It's a waste of, waste, waste of expensive chemicals. Another question is, uh, what are the environmental conditions uh, necessary to have a successful nest? What are the environmental conditions necessary? Um, well, we're, we've started measuring uh, moisture in the nest. We, we were measuring it in the sand. Um, so, um, oh boy, I, I as I say, I, I, the, the quick version, the quick answer is, um, if the sand is, is really wet, 
um, that's too wet. Um, the, the nests can handle warmer temperatures, you know, 33, 34. If there's enough water, enough water means um, that the sand is um, moist enough to provide, um, you know, that it'll stick together, but not, not, um, not fall apart. I've got, we've got four papers out that talk about the moisture level. Uh, the lead author is um, Alexandra Lolivar. I can, I can send you the, those papers or I can send, um, send the uh, links in the, ch in the chat. Um, they're also on my, my uh, research gate page if, if you'd like to find them. That actually, we, we actually describe what the moisture level is. Uh, the gas exchange we, is, is um, not something that's, that's turned out to be very predictive. We, we know there needs to be sufficient gas exchange for the ACE to develop. Now, what does sufficient mean? It means that the nest is not um, underwater or it's not spending much time underwater. If it, most of the nests can handle a little bit of, you know, four or five minutes of waves washing over them when the embryos are young. But as the embryos are get older, they're using more oxygen, they're giving off more carbon dioxide, and they're more susceptible to suffocation when there's water in the, the spaces between the sand grains as opposed to water vapor. Um, I, is that, I hope that gets at the, what the um, person was asking. I just, I just found the and chat box. Maybe, maybe that Oh, will... okay. So you'll see we have two more uh, questions, one from Raphael and one from Jerry. And then I think we're going to uh, finish afterwards. Okay. Okay. So uh, can other abiotic factors affect uh, hatching success? Definitely. Um, like I guess say heat, heat is, the, uh, is probably the, the big one, you know, too hot. The, the embryos can recover from too cool, but they can't recover when their proteins are denatured from heat. So I would say that's that's the number one thing. Uh, and um, there are some places in the um, like over in Malaysia where there are you know their their eggs are moved out of areas where there's a high probability of poaching or predator um, predators taking the eggs. And they, they're put into these areas where the eggs are put back in the sand under shade cloth. And, and there also are sprinklers, uh, uh, you know, irrigation devices elevated that sp spray water over the eggs. Um, I'm, sand grain characteristics certainly make a, make a difference because they do uh, affect how quickly an, an, a nest can um, uh, dry out or receive water. If the sand grains are too coarse, then the water percolates through and doesn't really provide the eggs with much protection. Um, if the, uh, and then also the eggs are more prone to dry out in really coarse sands. Um, there, there's some work that's been done on the albedo of the s sand, how much it light it reflects and how hot it gets. Um, most of that work is um, uh, look again relates it back to the nest temperature, um, and so is if if so can they improve uh, the the stress caused by the higher temperatures? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, I, my my first response is we need to fix the bigger problem. If you know the turtles are telling us something that that is really important, which is if it's too hot and it's getting, continues to get too hot, we're going to get too hot too. And uh, we're biological organisms. We do not, you know, too hot is something that's really dangerous. Um, and, you know, whether, whether we're talking about people or, or fish or um, in the food chain, organisms in the food chain, too hot is a real problem. So, uh, you know, this, this, changing our behavior so we're not uh, increasing the greenhouse gases is a, is a big deal. Um, and I, I know that took us off on a tangent, but that was really, I think, an important message. Yeah, yeah so we, we know how to make males. We know how to 
you know, we can do that in the lab. We know how to manage beaches up to a point. There are different political systems that, you know, as to some are leave things the way nature uh, had them. Others are, let's put shade cloth on the beach. Let's put sprinklers on the beach. Um, so there's a number of different things. Um, so then there is the percent female to male ratio may vary upon the depth of the nest. Yeah, the, the depth of the nest is, is actually a function of how long the turtle's hind legs are. Um, and so they don't seem to vary the depths very much. You know, every once in a while we'll come across a shallow nest. Uh, you know, so a, a, a nest, the top of the nest uh, for a loggerhead is uh, about, uh, let's see, about 45 centimeters deep, 40 to 45 centimeters deep. Every once in a while we'll, we'll find a nest that's only, um, you know, 20 or 25 centimeters deep. And, but that's rare. Most of them are, are pretty consistent. And the, you know, the depth of the nest is uh, somewhere along the lines of 70 to 80 centimeters at most. Um, and that's for a loggerhead. A uh, leatherback has really, it's a really big turtle and it has really long hind limbs. So the leatherback nest is usually down more like the top of the nest is more like about 60 to 70 centimeters down and the bottom of the nest is, is around a meter. When I have to dig up a leatherback nest, I have to dig myself a, a pit in the sand so I can reach the bottom of the nest. So. All right. Well, I think that's the end of the questions that came in. So Dr. Wynnikin, thank you so much for joining us for the seminar. It was great. Um, people are also thanking you in the chat. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me. And uh, as Dr. Wynnikin said, you can find pa her papers and the papers from the lab on ResearchGate, of course. Um, and uh, everyone from CCMAR, be on the lookout for the next seminar. We don't know what it is right now, but uh, look out for those emails. And again, Dr. Wynnikin, this is wonderful. So uh, we thank you sincerely. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. It was a, it was a pleasure to get these questions. and. Uh, like I say, feel free to, to email me if you need me need to answer a question that I didn't get to. Uh, I'm putting my uh, email address in the chat. And again, my, my uh, research gate page has, I think, all of our papers, including those on moisture, nest depth, the hormones, and, uh, and pr proteins. Really, really enjoyed getting a chance to talk to you all. And I hope you have a good day because I know in Florida it's still morning. So yep. I'm, I'm going to the Marine Lab right now and uh, meeting with my two of my students this morning. So we'll, I'll be masking back up and uh, going on to work on turtles. All right. All right. Well, everyone have a good weekend. See y'all. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.